Mata Yeva Mukuruwe Diga Tireva Reva Takambo Reva Tireva Muko Mata Yeva Mukuruwe Wana Iga Reva Baba Mana Takambo Reva Da Yeva Muko Mata Yeva Muko Ma Baba Mana Hona Kani Takambo Reva Ta Yeva Mukuruwe Ta Yeva Muko Ma Baba mwana hona kani takambo reva Nda hireva mkuru weta hireva mkoma Uongo rere iho 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 Yewere ne ikere mambo Uongo rere iho 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 Yewere o ikere mambo Iya kani da hireva mkoma Ta hireva mkoma we Tahireva mukuruwe, tahireva mukoma baba mwana. Tahireva mukoma, tahireva mukoma we, tahireva mukuruwe, tahireva mukoma iya kani. Tahireva mukoma, tahireva mukoma we, tahireva mukuruwe, tahireva mukoma baba mwana. Tahireva mukoma, tahireva mukoma we, tahireva mukuruwe, tahireva mukoma we.
some wonderful music um, while we were coming in, and I think we should all, I think we'd all want to give our thanks to the wonderful, um, the wonderful Umbira player, Gabrielle Makamanzi. Gabrielle. <laughs> I'm, I'm Dr. Deborah Johnston, and I'm the Pro Director for Teaching and Learning here in SOAS. And it's a pleasure to, um, to welcome you all here this evening. Now, whenever I speak to a new group of people, I do always say I have got a stammer. I'll get stuck on words, and please just bear, just, just bear with me when that happens. Um, we're here tonight with the South African High Commission in London to celebrate this, the centenary of the birth of, of anti-apartheid politician and revolutionary, Oliver Reginald Tambo. We would like to, uh, to very much add a special thanks to Brand South Africa for the support that um, has been provided for this event. Brand South Africa play a key role in promoting positive me uh, messages about South Africa across the world. Now, why here at SOAS? Well, as many of you will know, South Africa, um, SOAS is celebrating its centenary, so it's our 100th anniversary. And since the mid-1930s, we've offered courses in a number of African languages, including Zulu and Kosa. And in 1938, SOAS added Africa to its name in recognition of our teaching and research in African languages. In 1965, the Centre of African Studies was founded, and since 1991, the Centre has had formal responsibility for, co for, co for coordinating study, research, and, dis and discussion on issues to do with Africa um, in the university. So I, I wanted to, so that's, that, that's the past. I wanted to give you three glimpses of the way that we work on South Africa and in South Africa presently. And, and we can see these as part of our, one, our 100th anniversary celebrations. So SOAS and the University of Fort Hare, in collaboration with Canon Collins, hosted an event with the chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Unjabulu Undabeli, earlier this, this year. And the event took place at the University of Fort Hare, um, entitled uh, Const Constituting the, the Nation Beyond the Constitution, a South African Future. We also hosted our annual residential school in Cape Town, and the program was organized by the SOAS Center of African Studies in association with the South African Department of Trade and Industry. Um, and it was supported by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. And the aim of that residential school is to build, is to build skills, to develop talent, and to, and to enable African citizens to, in, to improve the, the quality of governance in their countries. A third thing we had the pleasure of doing last year, we, had, we hosted Alby Sachs, the world-renowned camp Cam, uh, campaigner for social justice and human rights, and of a former judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. And that event marked the 20th anniversary, anniversary of, the new, of the new South African Cons Constitution, and was entitled, South Africa, is this the country I was fighting for? So three glimpses of the work we do both here in the UK as well as in South Africa. Back to this evening's event. Um, Oliver Reginald Tambo, as many of you will know, was um, president of the African National Congress from 1967 to 1991. And it's particularly fitting that the event takes place this week. South Africa on the 27th of April will celebrate Freedom Day. And that day commemorates the first post-apartheid e elections held in 1994. It's also the 24th anniversary of, 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 of Oliver Tambo's death, who sadly n never saw the day that Nelson 
Mandela became president of South Africa as he died on the 23rd of April, 1993. Tonight's panel will debate re retracing O.R. Tambo's path towards liberation and the dawn of democracy in South Africa. And it will take us on a journey um, through, through, um, through his journey, which played a major role in the end of apartheid. So I'll now pass you over to Richard Dowden, who is director of the Royal African Society, who will say a few words before introducing tonight's speakers. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this evening's event. Thank you. I, I had uh, imagined that I would be talking to lots of young uh, uh, SOAS students um, uh, in the, at this meeting and trying to convey what it was, how different the world was in those days. But I noticed that there are one or two people here with hairs almost as gray as mine, and they probably don't need uh, too much detail. But I will just, I mean, just few of the shocking things that, shocking in a good way or a bad way, but that um, one of them, I was flicking through a book um, just to prepare for this and saw the picture of Nelson Mandela with a hair parting and uh, thinking, yes, at that time, uh, many Africans, not just in South Africa, but in the rest of Africa, really wanted to be, to show that although they were black Africans, they could still be lawyers or doctors or teachers, um, but they dressed very much and spoke very much um, in, a, in a very sort of British way and trying to be like white people. And that has completely gone. But I just thought, when just seeing that picture, it reminded me um, of many years ago where people, where many Africans were, were still trying to think if we, if we can do what they do, then we'll be equal. And that, how much that has completely uh, changed. Um, 1948, and this, again, is shocking. Um, a black man in a suit and tie walking, he's a lawyer, his name is Oliver Dambo, is walking down a street in Johannesburg. And a white man spits in his face and hits him and drives him off the pavement. Um, again, I mean, that's, a, that's almost in my lifetime, and it's just, uh, just amazing that that, uh, that was his earliest moment of radicalization, I think. Um, after the arrest of Mandela and the trial, or the, he managed to get out and, and come and live in Lusaka, and then would often come to London, and... I met him a few times, and he was one of the kindest, gentlest people you could imagine. He, uh, um, on two occasions, he'd say, have you had tea? And I said, no, and he said, I will go and make you tea. So he would get up and go and make tea and, uh, and, and give it. I mean, he was that sort of man, and he spoke very gently, but very, very strongly. And he had a difficult time, because not only was the, the ANC um, uh, uh, at that time certainly not welcome in Western capitals. It was supported by the, the, the Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union, so they were, it wasn't welcome there. But also there were other movements too. When the, the black consciousness movement started um, uh, with Steve Biko, um, and uh, it was all about identity politics, that, and different to the ANC's take on things. And uh, it was uh, it was Denzel Tutu who brought all those people together after the great crackdown and after Steve Biko was killed. Um, and I, in in 1979, I, I went to South Africa as part of a church delegation and managed to talk to some of the the Black Consciousness people there. And um, I said, Well, what do you you know? What's your message to the the, the people who've gone to London? Um, and escaped, and the unanimous verdict was 
tell them to join the ANC. And that really was, although it brought that black consciousness stream into the ANC, that was a major coming together um, that I think really um, took off uh, and changed and helped change South Africa. Um, our three sp uh, speakers tonight, um, I'll, I'll just introduce them one by one. Um, Mr. Brian Filling, uh, uh, who's uh, the South African Honorary Consul in Scotland and former anti-apartheid <coughs> activist. Um, he's been campaigning since he was a student at Glasgow University in the late 1960s and was founder of the Scottish Anti-Apartheid um, Committee in 1976 and served on its chair uh, as its chair from 76 to 94 when he became chair of ACTSA Scotland. Um, he's a member of the Executive Committee for Action for Southern Africa from 90, 1994 to 2011 and is now the Honorary Consul for South Africa in Scotland and he was awarded the National Order of Companions of O.R. Tambo, the highest award made to non-South Africans by the Republic of South Africa in 2012. And this is, this is a badge. And <laughs> that's the badge. Brian. Are you introducing the, rest, the other ones? No, I'm going to do it one by one. Right. <laughs> and what are you asking me to say? Well, I'd, I'd like to, I'd, okay, can you, can you tell us about, about the anti-apartheid movement in Britain and how it, or in, and in Scotland particularly, um, because I think the city of Glasgow um, declared itself, what, I could remind us what the city of Glasgow did, because I think you were a key part of that, just to, to give us a taste of the, the activism of that time. Maybe I should uh, uh, say, as you have, uh, Richard, and partly answering your question was that uh, I had to come to London to hear O.R. Tambo in the uh, <coughs> early days of the anti-apartheid movement struggle. Um, and I heard them often uh, then. Uh, but then later, um, of course, uh, he had to tour the world and wasn't as often in Britain. Uh, as he was elsewhere, building international solidarity. And of course, he, he had a house in London and Adelaide and the family stayed there, um, which I'm glad to see is now being commemorated. Um, but he finally came to Glasgow in uh, 1988. Uh, but that was in the back of the campaign, which uh, of course had gone on since the inception of the anti-apartheid movement, which in the UK was in 1959, uh, the boycott movement, first of all, and then it became a year later the anti-apartheid movement. And I've seen some of the people here who were in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, in Scotland, uh, there were uh, local anti-apartheid groups, student groups and so on, and activity. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 1976 that uh, a Scottish committee was formed to coordinate these local groups and trade unions and local authorities and so forth. And although that was the year of uh, Soweto, um, the Soweto uprising, which often with the anti-apartheid movement, it depended on how uh, high the struggle was in South Africa as to what happened uh, in the UK. Uh, for example, I can remember a meeting where it was in a low point of the Scottish Committee, um, and there were three people at this meeting, and by uh, two votes to one, uh, we defeated the, uh, uh, the, 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 the third person uh, who was wanting uh, the anti-apartheid movement to um, uh, uh, not just take up the issue of South Africa, but also take up the issue of Ireland. And much as we personally did, did uh, have views in Ireland, uh, we knew that one of the key f features of the anti-apartheid movement was that uh, if you take up too many issues, then you will lose unity. And so we struggled. Uh, and at that time, uh, of course, uh, Ireland was a big issue, as it continues to be. Uh, but it was very divisive. Uh, in terms of the anti-apartheid movement. 
they were defeated. And that was, as I say, a low point. There was only three of us there. At other, <laughs> at other points, of course, um, like when O.R. Tambo addressed the, the rally in Glasgow Green to send 25 marchers uh, to London um, uh, to, uh, to arrive on the day of uh, Mandela's 70th birthday, um, uh, the 25 were picked because uh, it was one for each year of the, the years that Mandela had spent in prison. And uh, there were uh, some 30 or 40,000 people uh, in Glasgow Green. So uh, although the anti-apartheid movement was uh, very successful in the end, uh, in terms of solidarity and mass support and so on, it did ebb and flow like the struggle did in uh, South Africa itself. But you mentioned, Richard, the uh, freedom of the city uh, of Glasgow to Mandela. Um, Glasgow is the first city in the world to give freedom of uh, the city to Nelson Mandela in 1981. And maybe I can just say a word about how this happened because it, it is now kind of part of folklore that this was all very positive and so on. Of course it was, but uh, the lead up to it was less than positive. Uh, in, in 1979, uh, when uh, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe and independent, uh, the Lord Provost of Glasgow invited the then uh, South African ambassador to lunch. We held a, a picket at the city chambers uh, with uh, placards saying such things as uh, having lunch with the South African ambassador is, is, is like eating poison. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if Biko knew what you were doing, how would he feel now? Uh, Biko, of course, had been murdered uh, by the apartheid regime. Um, this Lord Provost then came out and uh, made a, a statement which, to capture, as Richard was saying, the atmosphere of the time, he made a statement that, which was along the lines, you can't expect people just to come out of the jungle and form a government. This was in reference to... Uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Um, now there were plenty of people then who supported apartheid and who thought like that, uh, but uh, this didn't go down well. Uh, not just with us, but it didn't go down well with the Labour group. Uh, they threw them out of the, uh, the Labour group. And then at the next election, uh, Labour was re-elected and the incoming Lord Provost uh, we then put under a lot of pressure to compensate for this embarrassment that had happened. And uh, finally, we got agreement uh, that uh, freedom of the city would be awarded, uh, and was in 1981. And on the day of uh, the, the award, uh, a ceremony in the city chambers, the one we had been picketing with the previous Lord Provost, um, the Vice President of Nigeria at the time, Alex Ekume, uh, accepted the award on Mandela's behalf. Remember, Mandela was uh, still in prison, so it was, he was accepting uh, for Mandela in absentia. Um, and the Lord Provost was astonished when 16 high commissioners from the Commonwealth uh, came to the ceremony. And uh, separately from that, we had approached the Vice President to see if he would do a uh, as a particular meeting with the anti-apartheid movement, which he agreed to do because he couldn't do this in the ceremony, really, uh, which was to explain why Nigeria had uh, nationalised British petroleum in Nigeria at the time in response to BP busting sanctions against uh, what was then Rhodesia. Uh, so he was very happy to come to an anti-apartheid meeting to explain this. Uh, the Lord Provost, when we invited him, uh, said he had another engagement. And uh, it was only when he heard that the Vice President was coming that the other engagement fell away. Or, as they say, uh, it, it was overtaken by a better offer. And uh, he then came uh, to the, the after lunch, after ceremony, uh, anti-apartheid meeting. Now, at the ceremony, he had, uh, and his officials, uh, had uh, kept me to the side with Ruth Mumpati, who was then the ANC uh, chief representative. Uh, 
and who I should say uh, worked in Tambo's office. And I learned a lot about Tambo from uh, Ruth Mumpati. Uh, Ruth Mumpati and Mendy Misamang uh, both worked in uh, uh, the Mandela Tambo law practice, uh, which only existed for a few years. And both Mendy and Ruth later became uh, chief reps in Britain, and Mendy was the first High Commissioner after 94. However, Ruth and I were taken aside uh, to uh, because I was arguing that she should be in the platform as the ANC chief representative. But the Lord Provost was unhappy about this, so his officials kept ANC off the platform. And it was mainly because they, although they've been pushed into agreeing uh, that a party was a terrible thing and that Mandela should be given the freedom of the city under this mass pressure that they had come under, uh, they still didn't want to be associated with the Aram struggle. And uh, so there was a big resistance. And uh, so this Lord Provost then mentioned nothing about the Aram struggle at the lunchtime after ceremony. Uh, however, during it, and uh, uh, Alex Equemi uh, uh, said, is it okay uh, if Brian Fulling agrees, if I can invite this audience to come and hear me talking about Nigeria's support for the armed struggle and the nationalization of BP. So our meeting later in the day, uh, the Lord Provost came to it. And then at the banquet in the evening given by the, uh, the, the, uh, the Vice President of Nigeria, um, Ruth Mumpati and I were now at the top table, which was like this, you were above the, everyone else. Um, and remember earlier in the day we had been sitting in an anteroom arguing. Um, and here the Lord Provost in his speech uh, said, and anyone who doesn't support the, under, the armed struggle doesn't really understand what apartheid is like and why it is necessary uh, to support the armed struggle. And may I just say that uh, in the course of this, of course, Oliver Tambo became Commander-in-Chief of Mkunta Wesizwe, uh, the armed wing of ANC, uh, replacing Nelson Mandela because he was in prison. So the kind uh, gentleman, polite, <laughs> courteous gentleman that you talk of, which I agree he was, very considerate, very interested in people, very persuasive, very polite, was a Commander-in-Chief. You can't of, imagine of him, picking him, pick, him picking up a gun, though, could you? <laughs> uh, well, most uh, of the people who lead mm. armies don't pick they up guns. guns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you yeah. tell many yeah. American yeah, right. generals yeah, who, you know, <laughs> uh, let alone presidents. Well, uh, I wonder, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, he was just a normal yeah. commander in chief, uh, which is you do the thinking and the leading, and he did it extremely well. Um, but uh, one has to remember that as well as the kind, considerate, polite gentleman, as they, he was described in Western, particularly British terms, he was a revolutionary. Uh, and that's the bit that they didn't like. Uh, they'll, they'll put up with you <laughs> if you're polite and considerate and so on. But a revolutionary, that's a different thing. Uh, and, of course, Western business, given its support for apartheid uh, and the, the regime, uh, didn't like uh, the ANC uh, until eventually they had to deal with it. Uh, so just to finish this little uh, uh, anecdote, um, the Lord Provost then you know, demanded of the audience the really that they support the armed struggle. So we thought, as the anti apartheid movement, we are in here. Uh, so we then had the Lord Provost uh, invited by the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid to launch the worldwide mayor's Lord Mayor's petition uh, for the release of Mandela, which was done later that same year. Eventually, a couple of thousand uh, mayors, Lord Mayors and Lord Provost signed the petition. We then, he was on a roll by this time. He was now, uh, you know, he'd been at the UN Special Committee in New York. He had done this. Um, and now uh, he was easily persuaded to rename a street in Glasgow, which is now Nelson Mandela Place. And it was very opportune that this street should be renamed because uh, 
Uh, it was St George's Place. The stock exchange was in St George's Place. Remember what I said about Western business supporting apartheid, so we had chosen it particularly. But it was even more pertinent because on the fifth floor of the stock exchange was the South African apartheid embassy, where we picketed of them. So the South African uh, apartheid consulate had to uh, look out on the street names, Nelson Mandela Place. They, they refused to use the address and uh, uh, used a post office box. Can you imagine? You know, uh, <laughs> South African, well, they wouldn't have called it apartheid consulate, South African consulate, Nelson Mandela Place. I didn't like that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, so they then set up a Scottish South Africa society and a Scottish South Africa club to try and counter this. They took councillors, Tory councillors, by the way, uh, to uh, uh, South Africa to prove that the tricameral parliament that was set up, uh, where there was white parliament, coloured parliament, and uh, <coughs> uh, 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 other parliament, uh, the, you know, uh, but no Africans. Uh, and uh, of course, the whites still had a majority, so it was, but this was a kid on uh, move to Oz democracy. Uh, which they tried to sell uh, to the West, including to some of our councillors. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, they eventually uh, 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 decided they had lost this struggle and closed the consulate. And uh, now that, uh, for a number of years, I've been honorary consul, uh, I've been campaigning, you know, to reopen this consulate, but budgets don't allow it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but that's right. maybe enough Thank about you, uh, Glasgow. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. <laughs> our, our second speaker is Ken uh, Keeble, who's author of the book London Recruits, uh, a, f a former anti-apartheid volunteer. Uh, and uh, yes, tell us, tell us about your book. And uh, yeah, how, and look, and... and Looking back on it, the role that played in bringing apartheid to an end. Okay. When I hear that, I, think, I always think a bit of uh, Spike Milligan, his book about World War II. Um, Spike Milligan, his book about World War II, he's called, um, he's called Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. <laughs> so we, didn't, we didn't play that much of a part, but we played a part anyway. Is this all right for volume? Can you hear me up there? Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, in... Uh, nine, in uh, after 1964, when the when the uh, Rivonia trial came to an end, all the uh, almost all the ANC members who were not uh, in jail, along with Mandela, uh, had to leave the country to evade uh, arrest and torture. And so they were faced with the problem: how are they going to carry on the their liberation struggle when they couldn't go into the country? And the leadership group, led by Tambo in exile, uh, came up with the brilliant idea of recruiting. Uh, white, non-South African, English-speaking people uh, and uh, who could enter South Africa without arousing any suspicion. I was one of those people. I'm very glad to say we got two more of them in the audience. I didn't know this was open to the public or I would have got some more along. But um, we got Bob Newland over there who was uh, who did a, a, a sterling work, has spent a lot of time in South Africa, did a lot more than I did, in fact. Um, we got Stuart Round down here who smuggled large quantities of weapons into South Africa in the late 1980s. Can you, can you put your hand up? <laughs> Give us a wave. Um, so um, they headed on this night and they sent a, a leadership group to London. Uh, this is a four man group consisting of Joe Slovo. Dr. Yusuf Dadu, the leader of the Indian National Congress of South Africa, uh, Jack uh, Hodgson, uh, and uh, the young Ronnie Casrills, who was in his 20s at that time, and the others were all much older. And uh, Ronnie Casrills was given the job of, 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 of contacting people. They wanted young people because they wanted people with no, um, no family responsibilities and no dependents, because, of course, they got arrested, um, as indeed three of them did, and suffered for it. Um, uh, and uh, they wanted people who were politically committed, and they had to be white people. Um, and, of course, if, the, if you were one of the South African police or, or secret police and you're looking out for, for, for um, dangerous people entering the country to do some ANC work, you wouldn't look for someone like me with a white face, a British passport and London accent. It just wouldn't. And that, that was our, that was our, our um, disguise. Um, 
Now, there were two main, uh, there were two uh, ways in which Ronnie went about recruiting people. Uh, first of all, he enrolled as a student at the London School of Economics, where there was a lot of, lot of uh, left-wing activity going on at the time, and he joined the Socialist Society, and he, he picked people from there who he thought, uh, he asked them, and they, they said yes. And, uh, and he got some marvellous uh, results uh, and uh, marvellous people. Um, some of them were people of no particular political label, just ready to do the job. Others, so a, a small group of them were members of the International Socialists, which was the predecessor of today's Socialist Workers' Party. Um, the, other, the other way he, he found people was, and this was the great majority of the, of the people he, he recruited, was, um, he, uh, uh, was from the London district of the Young Communist League. Uh, there was a meeting held between uh, Ronnie Casrills and Joe Slovo, uh, on the one side, and on the other side was John Gollan, General Secretary of the Communist Party, and the International Secretary, Jack Waddis, and they agreed that the, that the job of uh, selecting suitable people would be given to George Bridges, who was the London District Secretary of the Young Communist League at that time. And when he, when he retired from that job, his successor, Bob Allen from Hull, took over the, the responsibility. Um, I was the second person um, uh, uh, selected through that method. I was a member of the Young Communist League, having been born into a communist family. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, George uh, approached me in 1967 at the London District Congress of the Young Communist League and asked me very cautiously if I was willing to do something and so on. And uh, then would I go to South Africa? And I very cautiously said, eventually said, um, well, I've got my final exams coming up at the City University in January. When they're out of the way, yes, I'll be willing to go. So I, I went to Johannesburg in, in uh, April of 1968 and I smuggled in 1,200 letters uh, in a pork's bottom suitcase uh, that were um, a, a addressed to members of the Indian community from Dr. Dadu, uh, and uh, did that successfully. And in, then in 1970, I was asked to go again and to find someone to go with me. I recruited my f friend, Pete Smith, uh, who turned out to be much better at it than I was and went on to work intermittently for the, uh, for the ANC for the next 20 years. And he went for training in the Soviet Union and in Cuba and he was kind of personal assistant to Ronnie Casrills over a period. And um, we, went to, we went to Durban in August of 1970, and we set off some leaflet bombs and a, a street broadcast. The leaflet bomb was invented in Britain and uh, tested on Hampstead Heath and elsewhere as a device, um, a device for um, distributing leaflets without getting caught, basically. Uh, and it did it very successfully. It never harmed anyone. It wasn't a bomb in that sense. It was totally not, a, not an anti-personnel weapon. It was just for distributing leaflets and getting away with it. And the street broadcast was a, a, an amplified cassette player. And uh, I'll never forget, we, 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 um, uh, we set out these all together at the same time uh, at a place where lots of African people were, had just come home from work in Durban in the whites-only city, uh, and uh, were, were gathering ready to collect to go to, uh, to get buses and trains for their um, uh, to, uh, back to the townships where they lived and um, so they were all gathered together in one place in kind of rush hour and I'll never forget the uh, the opening remarks on the on the broadcast which went off about the same time as the leaflet bombs it said this is the African National Congress this is the African National Congress this is the voice of freedom and that was followed by the singing of Nkosi Sigaleli Africa, the ANC anthem, by a choir of London exiles. Now, um, I didn't do any more work for the ANC after that. My personal life took over. In, uh, in 19... Uh, we all developed a, a deeply ingrained habit of never speaking about it. And only very, very few, very close members of my family knew that I'd been to South Africa. And the same with all the others uh, who did similar things. And we, 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 we all kept it very, very quiet um, as, a, as a duty. In 1993, Ronnie Casrills published his book, uh, Armed and Dangerous, My Undercover Struggle Against Apartheid, which is a very good book. I recommend everyone to read it. It's not just about South Africa. It's about the world and about Africa and its place in the world and about the Cold War and so on. Very thrilling book, too. And there's one chapter in that called London Recruits, uh, and that's where we got our name. Uh, and he, um, uh, he, he, But he gave a very, very limited account of, of, of what had happened. He didn't put any names into the public domain that weren't already there. Uh, and um, he, he, he told only a fraction of the story, actually. Uh, I think he was being very careful. But um, in, in 2005, I had my 60th birthday, and I asked myself the question, what have I got to do before I die? 
And when I'd asked, as soon as I'd asked that question, I knew the answer. Uh, I must, um, I must write uh, the story of what I'd done in South Africa. Was nobody knew about it, and, and um, it was be like it never happened. So I sat down and started. I'd done quite a bit of writing for publication by that time, um, and. Um, I sat down and in three days I wrote the whole thing and all the memories came flooding back, things I hadn't thought about for years. And then I, when I'd written that, I thought to myself, no, I won't just publish that. I'll um, try and co contact the other people who were involved in similar things and um, get them to write their stories and put them all in a book. And whatever happens, it's bound to be an interesting book. But I had only a very, very limited idea. In fact, I had no idea of the extent of the operation. I now reckon there were about 66 people who could be classified as London recruits and did a huge variety of things. Um, but the main thing is that uh, between 1967 and 1973, the London recruits did some kind of agitational work inside South Africa at least once a year, every year, in those years, 67 to 73. And, and from 67 to 71, uh, we hit five cities simultaneously. So it, it hit the headlines, it really hit the headlines in South Africa and it, it, uh, it astonished the authorities because they just banged up all the leading ANC members and banished the rest abroad. They thought the whole ANC uh, movement was finished, but here we were um, letting off leaflets, leaflet bombs and street broadcasts in five cities at the same time. And that really did, that really did knock them. Um, and um, uh, I, I wanted to mention that... Um, that uh, We've got, this is the book, as, I, as I've said. Um, all, all royalties from this book go to the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, which is a well, very good South African um, uh, charity. And it's being made into a film, and the director of the film, Gordon Mayne, is up there. I didn't know he was coming, but he is, the fellow with the hair. And um, he, he's doing a terrific job. He's done some wonderful research. And the book, the film, which comes out, we should do out about January next year, uh, is going to be a lot more than just the film of the book because of all the research that he and his team have done. And there's also a couple of websites about it. There's a website which we started off in 2013, I think it was, um, londonrecruits.org.uk, and then there's another website for the film and the trailer and so on, the progress, that's londonrecruits.com, and you can look at, look at that. Um, uh, uh, my ambition for this um, book and for the film is that they will inspire people to fight for a better world. That's the important thing, and I think, I think you can do that. I also think it has great educational value. Um, I want to say something else as well. So I think the, um, the story of the, of, the, of, the, of the apartheid system and the struggle against it, and the, consequently the life of Tambo and the story of the London recruits, can only ever really be properly considered in the context of the Cold War. The fact is that the United States and its allies supported the apartheid regime, not in words, but in deeds. Uh, the Soviet Union and its allies supported the ANC. That, that's, the, that's the fact of the matter. There's a film coming out shortly um, called Mandela's Gun, which you should look out for. And in that film, uh, there's a CIA agent who openly admits that the CIA told the apartheid regime where they could find Nelson Mandela so they could, they could bang him up for life. And he justifies it totally in Cold War terms. He said that if the ANC came to power, um, South Africa would become an ally of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. It would get access to the diamonds and the gold. They couldn't have that. So... That, that's the side they were on, and that's um, that's a very important thing to understand. Um, uh, I'm always glad to come and meet uh, people, especially students, and talk about the story. And uh, I think it's an inspiring one, uh, and I'm looking forward to answering uh, questions about it later on. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. So we've we've heard from the the activist who, who brought political pressure uh, in Britain. We've heard from the harmless leaflet bomber. <laughs> but now we're going to hear from someone who did actually do some real fighting for South Africa. And his name is Archie Sibeko. But he has another name too, a, uh, a nom de guerre, Zola Zembe. Uh, and he first fought for, for freedom as a trade union leader in the 1950s, but he was imprisoned and faced with a long prison sentence. He managed to flee the country in 1963 as a, a commander of Mkonto the armed wing of the ANC, um, and uh, worked in Tanzania and Zambia. 
and uh, he's uh, during the, the 70s and 80s he lived in Britain becoming the Western European coordinator of the South African Congress of Trade Unions and traveling widely to get support for the anti-apartheid activities. Um, uh, he went back to South Africa in, in 1990 and got involved again in union and ANC work, becoming vice chair of the ANC in the Western Cape. Um, but uh, he's now returned to Britain because he has a, an illness, sadly. And his wife will come and speak on... Uh, Golden. Right, okay. So would, would you like to... Uh, have we got an, another microphone? I tell you what, come and sit where I'm sitting and I will stand up so you can... Sit here. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm wearing the hat of uh, Mr. Archibald Siveko. Uh, I think it's an honor uh, to present his uh, view and knowledge of O.R. Tambo. And I'm not going to add any word from what he has given me. I'm not going to edit. I'm not going to subtract and so forth. But uh, maybe just before that, uh, because I'm the first to get this speech from uh, Archibald. No one has seen what is written here. But uh, in a short note, this was also the case in my lifetime uh, from 1982. I was the first person to hear what O.R. Tambo says on January 8 until 1991. So it is a privilege also to get this message from Archibald. It goes as follows. I'm very happy that tonight we are celebrating our late president, O.R. Tambo, and that I've been invited to take part. Probably many of you who knew him will agree with me that he was a greatest leader of our movement has ever had. I was lucky enough to have known him for many years and to have worked closely with him from time to time. It was always good to work with him. He was a man who showed respect for other people and listened to them. He was democratic and tolerant, not only to try to impose his views on others, but trying to move forward by consensus. No doubt, these ways of working were what made him so successful in both his international and ANC work. In my view, his three greatest achievements were, one, making the armed struggle possible by persuading certain governments to shelter us, to train us, and to provide us with arms, creating wide support for our liberation struggle throughout most of Africa and many other parts of the world. Keeping the NC together during long difficult periods in exile, when the struggle seemed to be making little progress. Myself, I met OR in December 1956 in Fort Prison, Johannesburg, during prison trial. 156 of us were kept there for at least a year in one big cell. There were many lectures, discussions, and debates, and we got to know our national leaders well. The next time I saw OR was in 1960. The national leadership had decided that NC needed an external mission and that he should secretly leave the country to establish it. He passed through Cape Town on his way and met the local leadership to explain what was happening and to say goodbye. 
Then he became a chauffeur and drove comrade Ronald Seagal, whose car it was, over the border into Botswana. Three years later, I was one of the first contingents of Mkonto Wesizwe, the military wing of the African National Congress, to be sent out for military training. And when we reached Tanzania, O.R. Tambo met us. He arranged various places for our training, and we soon moved on, me going to Moscow. That was the former USSR. After a year, we returned to Dar es Salaam and proceeded to Congo, where O.R. Tambo had persuaded the Tanzanian government to allow us to have a training camp. Later, OR called me and some others to give us new assignments to open up a joint front while the Zimbabwean liberation movement ZAPU on the Zambezi. I was given the responsibility for crossing of the first MK and ZAPU joint detachments over the mighty river Zambezi. OR paid great attention to the details, insisting on coming across the river himself on the reconnaissance the day before the detachment went over, making suggestions to improve safety. He was there too the following morning when they crossed. When the apartheid regime strengthened the buffer zone they had created around South Africa, it became almost impossible for any numbers of us to reach home, and this stalemate led to frustration in our camps. Umkonto Wesizwe Kedas became dissatisfied and angry and demanded change. OR responded to this not by imposing discipline on mutineers, but by agreeing to a conference in Morogoro. Tanzania, where there was thorough discussion of problems by delegates from Umkonto Wesizwe and from all sections of ANC in exile. Solutions and consensus reached and many changes in the leadership were made. This was how Oliver Tambo did things. I move on to trade union solidarity work and did not see much of OR again until April 1982. I was in Maputo, Mozambique, organizing a conference when OR arrived on his way to Maseru in Lesotho for the funerals of the victims of a South African raid which had bombed an area where ANC families and local people were living. He insisted on me going with him. We flew in a Lesotho airplanes, a six-seater. It flew very low over South African territory, casting its shadow on the ground below, looking like a giant mosquito. It struck me that when we were sitting, we were a sitting target for the enemy, but we got there safely, and I was able to speak, giving condolences on behalf of SACTU which was the South African Congress of Trade Unions, to the large crowds at the funeral. This was the last time I was able to spend my lengthy time with this great man. What a loss it was to the movement that he did not survive in good health to contribute to the events of 1994. May we all, and particularly the NC leadership, long remember him and aim to live up to the example that is set us. Achi Siveko or Zola Zembe, as known to many Umkonto Wesizwe and outside South Africa. Thank you.
much. That was a, a wonderful uh, presentation and uh, uh, understanding of. Um, who would like to ask uh, some questions? Sorry, did you want can to? I, can yeah, I, can please. I answer, yeah. This country is very cold, I know. I'm sorry, I'm sure. <laughs> that we should be proud to talk in our languages. Yeah. <laughs> uh, And I want to say, because uh, this is English speaking countries, I want to thank the ambassador to invite us when. Tambo is 100 years already. And go see now, Homeland Delayo. The second one, I'm also thankful you. Uh, the first time I saw uh, Utambo. Utambo Mjala no no Mandela except uh these are uh, and others sorry Usul. these I repeat what he said here, because it would be nice coming from me. Uh, these are the cream of South Africa. Even whatever you do, you think about them. Is it right that I'm doing here? Is it wrong? Because uh, they won't do things that is going to destroy ANC. Of course, all of them. Utambo is number one. That is what I wanted to say here. If Tambo was not around us at that time. We would be like, uh, I must start another one. Uh, 
I do start trouble sometimes. <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's good, you see. You make people talk. And so it's very, very important, you see. Uh, probably, if we're not talking, wouldn't be here today. Uh, it's very, very important that indeed. The first time I saw, that's what I was saying, is 1956. I've never seen them before. Some of, some of them have come from Transkai, Transkai, uh, Transkai, Transkai, uh, Transkai. All of them, if you look at them, you go kill the, the Congress. All of them look, check. Where do where were we born? Where, where, where do they come from? It is those those people, all of them, the lot. Uh, now, I just wanted to thank the. You can see now, already. I'm shaking. Uh, I just wanted to thank them to thank the ambassador to do this thing, and uh, our show is in South Africa. It's doing something else there. And he couldn't like that farm farm that she no one could do. My born joints are very good, you see. So that was excellent that to be here today. When, when uh, people of South Africa came here to, to say, Your hundred years, Sagulela, Mkuru good. It doesn't mean that uh, oh, Tambo cares for that. Uh, quiet is doing what he's doing. And uh, the most democratic uh, leader of our country, those who have seen him before, he doesn't afraid to, to discuss with anybody, whether it's a young boy, whether it's an old boy, no, he's never afraid or uh, fed up and so on. It's just discussed. And uh, even when we're crossing for the first time, a wangi, he was, I belong to those who looking around all, all my soldiers. What uh, cup somewhere, I'm a soldier. Let's see, because our funeral is on my soldier. Uh, my name is Tyler Pansy before working on the I wish, I wish it would be printed in the laundry that is South Africa. Thank you very much, people. It's a hard act to follow, That's, <laughs> but we, we have some time for a, a few questions, but we'll have to make them fairly quick. So who would, who would like to ask a, a question? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, the lady up there. 
Hello, uh, my name is Ify, I'm from Belgium. And Belgium has a totally different uh, story. I'm half Beninese, half Belgian. And uh, I'm almost 40 years old. We learned about apartheid in um, primary school. It was like a fairy tale, like, oh, the poor um, Africans were, um, finally, the apartheid is, is over, and uh, those poor Africans, this is typical Belgium attitude, like this very Catholic uh, thing. Uh, and it was never actually really explained how awful the system was. But what I am interested in is um, how long does a system like this, like apartheid, apartheid, it's a Dutch word, I speak Dutch, um, how long does it linger in the subconscious of people, the mental apartheid, I mean, because uh, it's created monsters, I think, also maybe even 5, 10, 20, 30 years later, and how many generations does a country need to, um, to, to yeah, decolonize or to... Would anybody like to respond to that? I, I do. It's a question for South Africa, yeah. not for us to answer. Hmm? Not for us, neither of us yeah. to answer, I think. No, I just, I would, I would say, uh, last year I was in South Africa and somebody called me boss. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, because I don't know you and I'm not sure. So it lingers on. It lingers on in some places. <coughs> and, yeah, another question or another statement here. Yeah, so the question really, um, when you um, give your... Can you hear at the back? Is that... Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Yes, if you... Yeah. There's a mic there. When you gave your introduction, Richard, you mentioned um, the um, eventual the amalgamation of the black consciousness movement with the wider um, liberation movement in South Africa, and I think you um, attributed some of that to the intervention, the good offices of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Now. Um, I have great respect for Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and I wouldn't want to take away anything from his, uh, his, his illustrious record, but if you have a look at Mandela's own um, autobiography, A Long Walk to Freedom, you'll find in there that Mandela's own view was that the clinching factor was that this new generation of young black consciousness radicals and so on were coming into the South African prison system. And by coming into the prison system, they were making contact in um, the, the very intense way that, um, uh, that, that, that we know happened. Um, and it became, in a sense, a, a sort of education, a sort of university. And that for Mandela, that was the key factor in achieving the, the, the unity that later was, uh, uh, was, was so successful. Yeah, I think I, you're, you're right. I think that's true. Yes, there was a question or a statement here from the gentleman up there. Uh, I am General Mashobo. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the ex Mkonto Sizwe uh, soldier and now a professional soldier in the South African National Defense Force. I'm a witness of the great leadership by Oliver Regional Tambo as he was the commander in chief. Maybe from the gentleman that has just uh, uh, posed or raised the question of the youth that went into Robben Island. Indeed, the role played by OR, because most of them were MK cutters that had undergone operations, that had taken, undertaken operations in the country, and they would be caught and, of course, arrested and sentenced to different uh, uh, sentences. I was sentenced to 20 years. Indeed, coming from the education by O. R. Tambo, because he was an educator. He, was, he groomed us. He educated us. If we talk about non-racialism, non-sexist South Africa, that is O. R. He taught us coming from the rural areas, from the townships, with nothing, no politics, no education. We had abandoned education in 1976. But when he, re when he received us in the camps in Angola and wherever, he st started us from the bottom to, to, to be commanders, 
uh, to be educators to go back and regroup and, and reach out and reproduce ourselves uh, within the masses. And that's what we did. But uh, going back, I wanted to also to, 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 to Comrade Archie there, over there, when he spoke about OR taking him from uh, Mozambique, flying him with that uh, uh, big mosquito-sized aeroplane <laughs> to Lesotho. Um, um, his statement in that funeral, because I was ready to go to the front, wanting to go and fight, because that happened on the 9th of December. He says, if the enemy knew in how much restraint we wage this struggle, it would not have committed this kind of atrocity. That is all our time. He, he also, I'm just going to quote him again, he says, a nation that does not care for its youth does not deserve a future. Nelson Mandela in the funeral of OR, when he addresses us being shattered by the death of a leader, the falling of a leader, he says he did more than anyone could do amongst us. He did more than anyone could do. Yes, there's a gentleman he here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, my name is Natalia Labia. Um, I'd just like to make a quick comment that I think, um, from my perspective, it was a very inspirational um, message from Mr. Sebeko. Thank you very much. Um, at this moment, I think it's only appropriate to for all South Africans and the effect of sort of diaspora um, as we are to take the um, incredible example of your, yourself and so many other South Africans for the work they did in exile and to continue it um, as the struggle continues um, for the soul of the ANC and, and for the country at large. And I think it would be great for the for SOAS and, and for the African society here to act as um, a, a, a forum for debate and for for activism because there's definitely a role that those South Africans in London and elsewhere can play in um, uh, broadcasting the message of what needs to continue happening um, back in South Africa. So I, for one, as a South African um, in London, very much hope to see that. Thank you. Any, yes, one, uh, yeah, up, up at the back there. So, uh, it's great to hear the role of um, British activists in uh, destabilizing the regime in South Africa, but it's an unfortunate fact that the British establishment, the state apparatus, and a lot of our uh, other institutions were actually involved in uh, propping up the regime. Uh, the TUC is a case in point that was involved in uh, collaborating with the secret services in uh, propping up the whole of the apartheid apparatus and destabilizing the ANC and other resistance organizations. Um, given the kinds of revelations that we receive all the time nowadays about the role of our agencies, uh, we've had revelations in Ireland that uh, uh, the British secret services were actually involved in planting bombs and claiming them to be IRA bombs. Given all of that, um, and Ken's suggestion that we need to be working towards a better world, how do we work towards questioning the role of our intelligence agencies? Because it seems to me that their defining apparatus is that they're forever able to convince the public that they work in the national interest. And I don't see in any which way how our state apparatus worked in our national interest in what they did in South Africa. Okay. Uh, I think we have comment. Oh, on yeah, that. we have a. Um, yes, okay. Do you want a quick comment on that? 
Yeah. Yes, it's a big yeah. question, of course, very difficult, difficult uh, to, to answer in, in a word. But, um, but uh, uh, we're, we're in the middle of an election campaign in which some of us are hoping to get a much better prime minister with a better foreign policy than we've ever had before. And, and uh, I think that could make a difference. Also, we know, of course, the Secret Service will be up against Jeremy Corbyn, as they are even as, as we speak, I'm sure. Uh, it's, it's a big question, but we mustn't be defeatist about it. We can win. The reason is we are many, they are few. That's why the people can win against the, against the state apparatus. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, Richard. Yeah. Scott. All right. Yes, you've got the mic. Yes. And after that, uh, John Battersby. Sorry. Yeah. sorry I'm, I'm Suresh Khan. I'm uh, from an organization called Action for S Southern Africa, which is the successor organization to the anti-apartheid movement. And I was the vice chair of the anti-apartheid movement the, from towards the end of uh, the period of the, to, when uh, South Africa became liberated. Uh, the comment I wanted to make, partly uh, in response to the question over there, uh, is uh, I think the issue should be that we should be active, we should get involved, we should find out what's going on, and we should campaign what I against what is wrong. And that's what many of us did during the apartheid re re era. Um, and I think O.R. Tambo played a huge, huge role in galvanizing the international community. Uh, you've heard uh, from the general about, and uh, from uh, uh, speakers up there about what uh, OR did within South Africa and what, what he did uh, in terms of uh, being the commander-in-chief of the armed wing. But also what was very important, remember after the Rivonia trial in 1963, the leadership of the ANC was thrown into prison um, and activism within the country was at a low ebb. Of course, in the end, it was the activism of the people of South Africa itself which liberated South Africa. We mustn't forget that. Uh, and, but what happened is our governments, the US government and the United Kingdom government, were collaborating with, uh, the, with the apartheid regime. Our role within the anti-apartheid movement here was to galvanize support against apartheid. And I would, you know, very much like to emphasize the role that OR had in going around the world, in gathering support across the African states, across Europe, yeah, and of course, Eastern Europe, and across the rest of the world. I mean, you know, I'm personally, I, I, I was born in India, and the first country to impose sanctions on South Africa was, of course, India, uh, back in 1947 when India was formed. Uh, but OR, you know, went around the world to galvanize that support against the, uh, the uh, uh, apartheid regime. And I'd like to know if uh, any of the speakers would like to make any comment about that. Well, yeah, I'll leave it. But of, of course, the African National Congress was, took its name from the Indian National Congress. That, I mean, that was there was a very close collaboration then. Sorry, you were going. To, you would like to speak. Yes, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, follow on from that uh, question about uh, O.R. Tambo's role in terms of international solidarity, because of course, the boycott uh, campaign, uh, which was launched, of course, by Mutuli, uh, Chief Albert Mutuli, who was a predecessor of Mandela and Tambo. Uh, uh, spread worldwide, but uh, of course it then led on to the sanctions campaign in which uh, there was a campaign to get states to impose sanctions and not just people to boycott. Um, and uh, <coughs> Margaret Thatcher had, uh, uh, she said famously uh, at the Commonwealth Heads of uh, in, in State um, that uh, she was the last to give in to uh, the call for sanctions. Um, and she said even her friend Ronald Reagan had to uh, give in before her because Congress had moved. So Britain was the, in terms of the uh, British state, was the last 
remaining supporter, really, of apartheid or a real consequence. Of course, there was Israel and so on who also collaborated, but it really reduced uh, that where uh, uh, Britain was the, was the key uh, final supporter. It's interesting that the, the, the movement in Britain uh, became so widespread in terms of the boycott uh, and so deep-rooted uh, that the campaign for sanctions was became a mass campaign. And uh, I think it was one of the, the factors in terms of, uh, it's often referred to, why did Mrs. Thatcher uh, get pushed out? And it's often said it was about the poll tax. But she had also lost in terms of the argument about apartheid South Africa, because they supported, the Tory government supported the apartheid regime uh, for as long until it really became virtually impossible. And it does show uh, about these mass campaigns, and that's where O.R. Tambo had, a, I think, a special uh, uh, characteristic, uh, which was that uh, we talked earlier about uh, commander-in-chief, but also very kind, uh, respectful, interested in people and so on. But he was m much wider than uh, has been explained. I mean, he really had a deep love of culture, for example, and he saw how important culture was uh, as a, a weapon in the struggle. Um, his son, Dali Tambo, uh, became a key figure in terms of developing a mandla, which was the ANC cultural ensemble, which toured um, uh, the world, um, explaining uh, in terms of, through culture the state of apartheid and the struggle against it. He also, O.R. Tambo, had a deep respect uh, based on his non-sexism for women and their role in the struggle. And he, he encouraged and promoted uh, women. And remember that South African society was deeply chauvinist uh, and that I think is one of the great legacies about the role of women now in, in, in South Africa post-apartheid comes from O.R. Tambo's understanding um, and of course he was a, a negotiator um, he eventually he, he, he concluded that we could not win the armed struggle against uh, the, this uh, regime we could inflict blows on them but ultimately uh, they had to be defeated by uh, the in underground struggle, the arms struggle, sanctions, and international solidarity. And O.R. Tambo linked all of these in a fashion which was really, I think, quite uh, incredible, given that he was up against uh, the whole of the West for so long uh, and eventually uh, moved there. So his role in terms of creating negotiations and so on um, uh, is amongst one of his other great attributes. And I think it has to be said that whilst Nelson Mandela uh, became the worldwide revered statesman and figure, one has to remember that it was O.R. Tambo during the 27 years that Mandela was in prison, it was O.R. Tambo who led uh, the, the ANC, united them, kept the leadership, won this world support. And I think he's greatly underestimated in terms of the role he played as an individual. I'm very pleased that when you fly into Joburg, you land at O.R. Tambo Airport. That acknowledges... Uh, in fact, uh, yes, there's a, a question here. John? Yeah. Um, thanks. I'll uh, stand if I may. Uh, John Battersby <coughs> from South Africa. Um, very moving uh, uh, address from Archie Sebeko. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us and to Richard for reading the first part. Um, Brian Filling, um, who uh, uh, hosted us when I was at Grand South Africa for the uh, Commonwealth Games in Mandela Place and uh, taught us the, uh, uh, or told us about the amazing event of. Uh, of, uh, of, of Mandela's um, visit to Glasgow. Um, and uh, Ken Keeble, of course, who uh, uh, was the inspired um, um, thinker behind this wonderful book on the London recruits. I saw the uh, trailer two nights ago, um, and it looks like it's going to be a very exciting film. Um, <coughs> I just want to tell a short um, anecdote, if I may. It's not nearly as dramatic as exciting, 
um, as a lot of what we've heard tonight. But um, I was a journalist uh, based here in London um, for the South African Morning Group Rand Daily Mail South African newspapers from 83 to 87. And uh, I used to write a column uh, in which I would share with the readers in South Africa what the ANC was saying over here as far as I was able to do so uh, without censorship kicking in in South Africa, the Suppression of Communism Act and the Anti-Terrorism Act and so forth. And I became more and more uncomfortable <coughs> about this role that I'd been thrust into. Um, uh, and even with that fairly mild stuff, most of the newspapers stopped using my column because they thought I'd fallen under the influence of international terrorism and so forth. Um, <coughs> but the editor of the Cape Times, Tony Hurd, continued publishing uh, this column. And uh, I then wrote a column saying I can no longer censor myself um, in what I can tell you about what the ANC is saying. So I'm going to do an interview with Oliver Tambo. And if the editors want to censor it, that's fine. That's their decision. But as a correspondent, it's my duty to, to, to do that. So Tony Hurd picked up on this. And he called me and he said, hang on, hang on. Um, I, I'm coming to London. So I said, OK, you're coming to London. Um, and clearly, he didn't say he was coming to interview Oliver Tambo, but that's the, what, what I gathered from it. And uh, Freni Ginwala, who was my um, contact at the time, um, said, look, you know, we can, we can set up an interview with Oliver Tambo, we can do it. So Tony Hurd, to cut a long story very short, because Tony writes about it in his, in his book, um, cut a long story short, we uh, arranged the interview through Freni, uh, we went up to Muswell Hill uh, to uh, the Tambo home and were very cordially received with myself, Tony Hurd, and the photographer. And we sat for three hours, and Tony had his, his uh, tape recorder on for the whole interview. And uh, he was very cryptic about the whole thing. You know, he said, thanks very much for setting it up. He didn't say what he was going to do with it. And he headed straight back to South Africa, uh, got his secretary, who'd been sworn to secrecy, to transcribe the interview. And uh, the only other person he's told was his deputy editor because he was going to see the proofs of the paper that day anyway, so he sort of briefed him on it. Appeared the next day, um, 2,500 words interview, the first time Oliver Tampa had been heard in South Africa for uh, 30 years. Uh, so his image was one of a bloodthirsty terrorist, totally demonized, and we've heard today quite correctly about the two sides of the man, the, the, the gentle, um, polite uh, diplomat and the revolutionary, um, but South Africa's had another image of him, and that was as uh, completely and totally negative, and the media image wasn't much better than, than, than the public image. In fact, the media image, of course, formed the public uh, image. So the interviewer appeared, um, Tony Hurd was duly arrested, um, marched off to police headquarters, um, and uh, held for questioning his uh, publisher gave him very little support and, and and when it was more respectable to do so 18 months later fired him um, and uh, that incident it turns out in retrospect when that interview was published in the first quarter of 1986 it was almost exactly the same time that Nelson Mandela had started to speak to the Commission of prisoners in uh, in Polsmoor, which of course led to the interview with Kubi Katsia, the justice minister and eventually um, with P.W. Boerter. So it was a fascinating kind of confluence of what was going on inside the prison and what was going on outside, and that played itself out over the next, uh, next four years. So um, my memory of Oliver Tambo is, I have to say, as uh, an extremely, um, <clears throat> an extremely uh, impressive leader, um, somebody who listened extremely carefully considered things extremely carefully, and when he spoke, it was with great, although it was with a quiet voice, it was with great authority and great gravitas. And uh, it was uh, an honor to have uh, known him. Um, I met him on several occasions, but of course that three hours in Muswell Hill was uh, a very special um, occasion. And, uh, and I think that that interview, um, in its own quiet way, there were no guns or shots fired, but uh, it was a bombshell in South Africa, because uh, having been completely demonized, people were reading an absolutely rational, reasonable account of why things had to change, and they had to change very fundamentally and very quickly. So um, that's my story. Thanks. And I 
I think on, on that note, I, don't, I think that would be difficult for anybody to follow. So, and it is eight o'clock, so I think we're going to have to call this meeting to a close. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming. It's been an absolutely fascinating evening. I'm glad it's being recorded because I don't think there'll be very many more meetings like this. Well, there may be, but I mean, this is, I can, I can see there that uh, uh, this, this is not something that comes around every year. This is an amazing occasion. So thank you all very much for coming and thank our panelists. Uh, yes, please. And now we, we have a, a poem, is, it, is that right? Yeah. Jesus. Sorry. Yes, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. All right. Good, Please. I'm so sorry, I, I don't, I, I haven't got your name on my crib sheet. That's so. all right, I was told that, yes. uh, so it's all up to, yeah, I was supposed to ambush the stage tonight, so I was glad to do that. My name is Leah, I'm South African, it's, I'm a poet, and um, very grateful to be here. Thanks so much to Brent South Africa, the embassy, and of course, so was. Um, maybe just as a quick anecdote, five seconds. Uh, Tumble for me, I think one of the greatest things about him that I suspect might have been understated is his humility. And uh, much of the fact that Mandela became the global figure that he did was as a conscious decision that was taken collectively by the ANC to actually make Mandela the face of oppression. So he could have ordinarily put himself forward as he was the leader at the time, but he didn't. And also somebody said to him, you are the leader of the ANC. And he said, actually, our leaders are in prison. So he was always, he tended to be more resident and very um, uh, careful not to put himself too much at the forefront. And I suspect that is um, a quality that I take away from, from his life, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I will read something really short because, um, and precisely, primarily because he was based in London and... I'm glad that at the end, towards the end of the discussion, we came to um, the discussion of around how Margaret Thatcher, for example, resisted imposing sanctions on South Africa. And the, the paradox of Oliver Tambo living in this country, um, mobilizing the international community to put pressure on the South African government, and at the same time, living in a country that was seemingly resistant to the idea of imposing sanctions, over and above that, um, this country had its own racial problems. Um, so I'll read this very this piece based on, perhaps that um, speaks to how beautiful this city is and how this city primarily is built by the labor, the cheap labor, partly of South Africans, notwithstanding, of course, slavery. I titled it, Clean before you pray. The city is no place to begin prayers from. Trees buried under concrete with no crimes to their names. We know how we built them and how we slaughtered the rebels. Oil and gold have a source. So does civilization fate. Arenas reverberate with national anthems, God and savagery, subliminally inseparable. We are not taught but drenched in it, the state of slumber and avoidance of truth. Tarred roads, the flesh of the dispossessed, door handles of bones, bones of the dead. The sides of a great city, a brazen monument of untold mass graves left somewhere after a handshake. A city maverick sprays a question on the wall, and the mayor on Wall Street calls the fire engine. With the riot squad, they wash the blood off the walls. The weapon is silence. It is silence. It is silence. It is silence. 
it is silent and it is in their hands. The city's shiny museum thrusting its renovated facade into the sky, an old church building still standing in denial. The missing verses are still missing in the scrolls on display and the paintings unveiling the extent of the scam swallowed in protocol. The kids who leave the hip hop that went over the heads of kings of the limelight have no gathering place left to keep the intention provocative. The Olympic flame driving homelessness, driving the homeless out of the city. There are a million reasons to keep the city unspoiled, to dispose of lives which inconvenience the good story of this amphitheater. So we keep walking into buildings and this opium, the same tale we inherit and hand over to the young. We mean not to harm them, but our complicity drowns them in the orchestrated silence that will start their own madness. If we begin our prayers here, the wave will bring down the towers which house the ringleaders of loan sharks, the men who want to build us more roads and prisons, all in the name of what is good for the people, the good people living in the refuge of religious answers. The norm of pathological patience is an actual fact. And the rise of motivational books, the cruelty of a diagnosis deferred. Ganja smokers in a city mounted with billboards on steroids. A beautiful city has been built and daily laborers must be thankful. The alarm clock must keep ringing and amusement parks obstructing the space where broken faith can be seen and unhindered and unfiltered. Every addiction starts with a promise and the city, no doubt, also magnetic. A drug will never tell you what it will do to you. The city shifts the files and shows you what you're not looking for. Praying from a place like this, is there a place in the body that is quiet? In there, something will speak and when we get off our knees, there will be no tomorrow until the names of rebels and the broken are inscribed on the walls of this city <coughs> that's been looking away from its doing. Generations of caregivers and cleaners are still without their due inheritance. Someone is paying the price for the long glass carrying the beautiful buildings. And it's not those with the most to say about why the city must reach the sky. Now, what did we do? What did we do with the hands with which we would carry one another? Or the response that the rebel was hammering into a rock when he said, no, I do not, <coughs> I do not dream of ever making it on my own. I dread the islands you make of people. The smell of the old man's dead body finally pulls a neighbor to his door. The note on the floor is a long letter. The note is a long letter. And what could, is a long letter. And what could open the human heart? But who dwells? on the echoes of the random dead, when the city is always louder than reason. Recreational needles abused no less than the immunization of ourselves against everything but love itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very moving. Thank you. Um, now I call on the South Africa High Commissioner to just give a, some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, diplomatic colleagues, distinguished guests, 
particularly the panel that is sitting in front of us that is engaged with all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. On behalf of the government of South Africa and its people, I'm delighted that tonight we celebrated the legacy of O.R. Tambo in a form of a lecture where speakers shared with us their experiences. Let me start by indicating that the year 2017 marks the centenary of the late Oliver Reginald Tambo, who played an integral role in the liberation of South Africa. He dedicated his life in pursuit of equality and justice for all South Africans and was one of the founding fathers of our constitutional democracy. Let me extend my appreciation to the speakers who took all the effort to make sure that they honor our invitation to be part of the centenary celebration. I would like to thank the audience. You were fantastic. It is highly appreciated that you also took time to attend this event. To the School of, Ori of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, thank you for working with us to prepare the event, most of all for allowing us to use this magnificent venue. To Brand South Africa and the Royal African Society, thank you once again to all of you for your contribution. The event is one of the series of events that we are going to celebrate the legacy of our Tambo, which means there's still some more that will happen in the name of O.R. Tambo. Please do watch the space. Finally, let me thank you for attending this event again. I hereby invite you to the reception at the Brunei suit, which is the venue above this auditorium. I thank you all. Thank you very much, High Commissioner, uh, and thank you, SOAS, as well, uh, and to and Brian Filling, um, Ken Keeble, and I think star of the evening, Archie Sibeke. Thank you.